Welcome back to another Sam.gov Bids Live episode number 49, where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on Sam.gov for your small business. Today, we will be reviewing five small business solicitations that I have pulled up on Sam that we will be jumping into in just a second. But if you are new here and you don't want to miss future Sam.gov Bids Live episodes, Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. So hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Let me know what state you are representing in the chat. Let's light up the country. Let's see where everybody in our community is located. And we're actually coming off of a live stream uh, from last night where we did a little sneak peek and a Q&A for the uh, Legal Middleman Method class that is opening enrollment is now open we'll talk more about that later but feel free to check that out or listen to later on and we'll um we'll talk more about that as well but we're fresh and back at it again with episode number 49 today let's go ahead and take a sneak peek now at the episodes episodes at the solicitations rather that we're going to be reviewing in today's episode bid number one we have medical career services Bid number two, we have a pre-post yellow ribbon event. Bid number three, we have fire alarm inspection. Number four, we have food waste services at Hawaii commissaries. And then we also have a second uh, South Carolina yellow ribbon event as well for the Army National Guard. So what is going on, everybody? Good to see everybody. Code Knights is always hanging out with us from Georgia in the building. Shanty B uh, as well in the house. Again, even from last night, hanging out from Florida. Prunette Bennett out of Florida. Byron as well. Texas, good to see you, Byron. G out of Texas. We got Big D checking in from Chicago. What's going on, everybody? Hello, hello. Kenneth Robinson out of New York. And uh, Rocio Morales from Chicago, as well as so many more to be joining us over the next couple minutes. Um, as you have your as you have your questions, put those in the chat. And if you're new here, if this is your first Sam of Bits Live, let me know if this is your first live that you're uh, catching as well. And the way that this works is I don't review any of these bids ahead of time. This way we get to go through them raw and real for the first time together because that's exactly what it's going to be like for you when you're on Sam.gov or maybe you're already doing this and you hit roadblocks, you hit things that don't make sense, stumbling blocks that way. You have a bit of a safety net here doing it together on the show to further equip you and get you skilled up so that you can go and do this for your small business um, on your own. So with that being said, guys, as you join, keep it coming in into the chat. And we're going to go ahead and dive into our first bid together for today's show. So the medical career services. This is for the Air Force. This bid is due on November 17th, so not too much time for this. They're actually pointing out uh, Anchorage, Alaska time, time zone. Uh, small business set aside, total small. We have the 492110 Couriers and Express Delivery Services NAICS code. And again, that Alaska-based place of performance. Now, it does indicate that there were two amendments. Looks like the first amendment was to change verbiage for the technical evaluation. to include price and technical. And then the second amendment looks like some Q&A. So estimated time um, per mile between delivery, delivery locations and pickup. Again, this is courier services. And then also, is there a specific list of materials that are being transported, like what's being moved? And it says blood samples, uh, blood components for transfusions, urine samples, tissue specimens. So definitely medical in nature uh, for the courier services. In terms of attachments, we have our clauses, wage determination, statement of work, pricing schedule. We have, looks like a solicitation and then maybe an amendment to the solicitation. I can't tell by the title, but we will check those out and try to get started here with the solicitation itself. So this document is only six pages. Let me go ahead and zoom in for you. Let's 
right off the bat, we are hit with our period of performance and also a base plus four years, which we love for our legal middle manners out there for stacking contracts, building a book of business. This is potentially something that fits the bill for your LMM service. Um, starting with POP kicking off this coming January, January 15th, going through September 14th, so not a full year there. Um, but then after that, January to January on the cuff for the uh, additional year. So I'm not sure what would explain this gap for October, November, and December. Um, maybe we would find out. Maybe it's a mistake. I'm not sure. What would make more sense if this was going from January to September and then this option period kicked off in September that where there wasn't a break in service? So I don't know. This I question this a little bit. Could be an RFI that we jot down on the side to potentially ask for, for clarification about. Submission of offers, solicitation number. Okay, so this is going to be typical instruction offers. And then we go to specific instructions. The response shall consist of two separate parts. Part one, price, saying submit one copy of the price schedule. And then part two, technical summary. Copy of the service to be provided with specifications that clearly demonstrate that you can meet those specifications. And then the award will be made to whoever's price quote is conforming to the solicitation and is determined to be the lowest price. In other words, I would read that as whose quote is technically acceptable and then determined to be the lowest price, which further translates to an LPTA evaluation or a lowest price technically acceptable. They're saying the government will award a uh, contract resulting from the solicitation based on what's most advantageous. But again, they are reflecting price and technical acceptability, further validating our suspicions here with the LPTA evaluation. And they're saying what it means to be minimal or to check the box or to be qualified as technically acceptable. They're saying contractor must be able to provide all the products described herein which means the ability to go from point A to point B, transport these uh, blood transfusions and, and medical specimens as they've described in the, the Q&A already. And I do understand, yeah, okay, so a basis of contract award, this is competitive action, which will be made to the lowest price quote. So they officially have told us here for the award. Um, I do understand the Q and A now because the solicitation was very short and they didn't come out and say the answers to some of these things. Now it looks like the same exact document, but maybe that little technical change was made per the Q and A. So I think that explains those two. We didn't see the pricing yet. So for the pricing factor, part one, remember they said, you know, fill out the pricing thing, but what is that? In this instance, it is this, it is this document. It is this Excel sheet. They do have it broken down by base and option years, and they've broken it down by two types of courier services and then a third of four holiday courier services. And they're giving you a quantity and a unit price. The quantity they're saying is each. So each service, each run, right? We could always ask for more clarification around that. And this would be virtually impossible to fill out if they didn't give you the quantity. So all you are doing essentially is the unit price and that's gonna to calculate to the clean total, which will then add up to the grand total for the entire base year and option years going forward. So that's pr pretty straightforward, I would say. Um, we do have the statement of work, which you would kind of wanna make sure, and this is where we're seeing the rush and the stat defined as well. Um, what you would, I kind of lost my, my point of what I was saying, to be honest, <laughs> um, we'll just dive into this, uh, a courier service is required to deliver to pick up from various medical facilities for the blood bank of Alaska, Providence hospital and Alaska regional hospital services. Service needs to be available anytime, day or night, 365. And we require the courier to be able to be here for pickup within 20 to 30 minutes of a service call. So dispatch 20 to 30 minutes. So there's, they did define this, this is what I was looking for. Rush service is defined 
as pickup and delivery within two hours. What about stat? Stat services defined as urgent services requiring delivery within an hour or less of notification. So that is why they're allowing you to price differently because one is more urgent than the other. And they're also giving you different quantities, fewer quantities for the stat. Um, the rush is, even though it says rush, it's actually not as rushed as the stat. Here's the responsibilities. And not going to be too terribly long here, pretty straightforward. Not a complicated contract. You know, the, the pricing really spells it out and those further definitions further define what this really looks like for this contract. And since we know it's a base plus four, we don't know anything about incumbency or anything like that. We do know it's out in Alaska, so that may or may not affect us, but you know, it may not. Um, but the biggest thing for that one is going to be, once again, the, the dispatch and then the rush versus the stat within you know two hours or less than one hour. And then the service being able to be accessible 365. Uh, you'll have to be able to have responders ready to go for something like that, which means they're going to have to be physically close or just in route at all times, which sounds costly. Okay, what's going on with chat? Kenneth Robinson, first live. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you, Alphabet, again. We got Charlize out of Georgia. And we have uh, Inyaga Jr. out of North Carolina. Hey, Country Notary, good to see you. Glad I could catch the live. Always informative. Appreciate you so much. Thanks for hanging out with us. We have uh, 31 tight, not a California as well, and Wise Planner in Texas. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Always great to light up the country, see where our community is, see how many states we can represent. So now we can go ahead and move on. And as you have questions, feel free to post those. Our second bid for today is a pre and post yellow ribbon event, which I know a lot of people have become fond of over time and may have not even known about them um, until our channel, which is really cool because I always say, let me, let me get the mic here. I always say that it's one thing to, I guess we say this a lot, assuming what the government buys leads to problems. We know this, I soapbox this a lot, but there are also just services that exist in the government space that don't even exist in the commercial space. So to make certain assumptions, you are actually leaving things on the table because for example, yellow ribbon events do not exist anywhere outside of the you know government agencies and DOD more specifically related to the army, right? And the national guard. You're not gonna find that in commercial space. You might find something similar to that. If you know anything about yellow ribbon events, it's, it's lodging, it's conference rooms, it's food, it's audio visual, but with the government, they have their own unique set of needs, which is why I say working backwards from learning what those needs are, there may just be a lot of opportunities there for you, like Yellow Ribbon, which so many you know have never even heard of, except when they found our channel and they started watching these, these episodes. It's like, wow, that's a thing. I think I'm interested in doing that, right? Um, so that's, that's why what I mean, and that's the point I try to make when I bring things like that up. I think this is just a great example. So for this, particular yellow ribbon, we're looking at Iowa, uh, Army National Guard, due November 20th, small business set aside. We have the Hotel Nakes code 721110. Um, again, this is Waterloo, Iowa. They are requesting uh, quotes, RFQs. It says straight up funds are currently not available. Award will be made only if funds are made. So it's up to you if you decide you want to invest in putting a response together or not. However, funds are not currently available does not mean, again, that funds won't be available. It means it's November and we're in the first quarter of the 24 fiscal year for the government and funding and budget has not been provided largely yet. Okay, they don't have their funding yet. And that's what they mean why funding is currently not available. What will be interesting is what is the POP on this? And we're seeing the period of performances uh, December 1st and 2nd of this year. So only a couple weeks away, 
Okay, now that tells a different story. Now funding isn't available, but this event is supposed to go on before Christmas. Probably worth an RFI for further explanation, but up to you. So they're saying award will be made to lowest price. So probably another LPTA quote here. Offers shall complete the reps and certs. All quotes shall include the following. And they're saying names and ad addresses of proposed meeting and lodging venues. So the hotel. Drawings and diagrams of the meeting venues to include dimensions and maximum, maximum occupancy. So the government knows uh, the size is a fit. Menus for all required meals. So we know meals are required. And then a, a POC table just for your, your company. And probably maybe the hotel POC as well, but everything's supposed to flow through you as the prime. So we do have Kelsey and Vicky in contracting, Kelsey Letcher and Vicky Williams, letting us know that questions are due no later than the 8th of November, and that time has already passed. So for documents, we have Q&A, a statement of work, uh, clauses, and then a pricing schedule. Let's just take a look at the pricing schedule since this is gonna be pricing driven as it is a RFQ, it is a quote. So we fill out this company information here, letting contracting know that we are a registered government contractor. And then pricing clin is, <laughs> yikes, one job. So the price for the entire event, inclusive of lodging, meeting rooms, audiovisual, parking passes, meals, beverages, and applicable service fees should be all boiled down to one price. For December 1st and 2nd. So contracting is saying, not that they don't care, but they're less concerned with the breakdown of what these things are going to cost individually that they've listed. And they're more concerned with what the total price is to compare apples to apples to apples for all contracts that were submitted in on this to compare what that total price is. And then they're going to refer to, for example, um, technical acceptability factors like room occupancy and dimensions that they mentioned, um, hotel name, the location, how far is it, so that the um, participants aren't going to have to travel too far. Those are going to be the pass-fail recs on this, and then they're going to look at the price. So fairly straightforward. The statement of work may have some uh, information that is necessary. For example, I'm just starting actually from the end and work my way backwards. They're telling us some more details about like children's lunch on Saturday, the number of meals, very important for your pricing, beverages, child care room, child and youth room. So you have to have all this. So at a minimum, I would encourage you to be, even though it's price, it's a quote, you're going to have to have a few pages at least in your proposal response or your RFQ response giving contracting confidence or at a minimum validating to contracting that yes, this is all provided. Like here are the rooms that are provided, you know, just a little matrix or something like that could be easy. If not just like a little list, um, basically saying, yes, we have this. Yes, we have that. Yes, we have that. So that you can check the boxes for all of these things to be found technically acceptable so that your price can actually get looked at instead of being thrown out saying, I don't even know what this, you know, if contracting says, we don't even know what this price represents because because they've only asked you for one price. And this is kind of why I laughed when, when I, when I said this, because if contracting is asking for one price only, but it's going to be a lowest price, it's tempting for bidders, contractors, especially those that don't watch our, our channel and our stream, right. To just give contracting the, the price, right. And maybe like a cover letter or something like that. Maybe a picture of the hotel. Okay, whatever. A map, fine. But that is not enough information, even for a lowest price bid or an RFQ, for contracting to fully evaluate. Because what does this price represent? And I'm sure contracting has made the mistake many, many times in the past. I mean, I'm not sure. I know definitively where they do this. And then they get into a relationship and award a contract to a contractor where there was not that agreement on the, those details, right? So contracting puts themselves at a little bit of risk by not asking vendors, us industry to further like break down, i.e. in a pricing breakdown. They're, they're inviting in 
trouble, not on purpose, but from inexperienced vendors to, again, just give them one price and say, here you go. Anybody who watches our channel or follows our training is going to know we're still going to break it out because that's not only how we can be sure that contracting knows exactly what we're quoting, but we also know that our competition might not be doing that. And then we find this is a way that we find a, a competitive advantage through our proposal on bids, even when it's primarily about the price, right? So we, we find a way to be competitive advantage, even within the technical acceptability criteria. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's really important and it's really easy to overlook, but if you just do a little bit more effort in your proposals and break this stuff out, the other guys might not, or worst case, if contracting is doing their job right, they look at the price and they say, I don't know what this means. So even though you are the lowest price, I'm going to throw you out because we're not going to enter into risk with taxpayers dollars to, you know, maybe someone who's only going to give us half the number of rooms or they forgot to include the meals or they didn't do the child conference rooms, right? Because none of that was spelled out and defined in their proposal. They just gave me a price because that's all that I asked them for. You see, this is a little bit of a 50 50 thing but we're helping contracting with our approach and we're in doing so we're helping ourselves to be um, not only compliant, but competitive. And that's what we'd like to focus on. And then there's a Q and A, and then I think we can move on from this and, and uh, see if we have anything in the chat. There was just one question. We'd like to know the look, if the location is acceptable and they said the venue name deleted. So contracting sanitize that. And their answer was, we cannot pre-evaluate the acceptability of a potential event, a venue. I advise you to submit your offer with your proposed venue and we will evaluate from there. You may submit more than one offer if you have multiple venues that meet the requirements of the solicitation. Interesting. And that almost gets into what we also talk about with alternative proposals, something you don't hear uh, mentioned a lot or talked about a lot. But if you do have potentially a way at getting the job done that's just different than what contracting is asked for. You submit your initial proposal the way that they want it. And then you submit an alternate proposal the way that you maybe suggest or recommend that could be at a cost savings or at a value increase that you really think contracting should know since contracting is relying on you industry to be the experts in their field. They certainly don't know everything. They just go and quote the job themselves to get their own IGCE to determine what they think it should cost. And then they write it up and solicit it out to us. And then they take our numbers and compare it to their numbers. But what happens if when they're doing their research, this was something that was overlooked or their PM and their engineer or their you know end user who got the quote on their end and gave it to contracting missed something or just didn't know, right? You as the expert or your team as the experts, right? If you're legal middlemanning may be able to present something that is of more value or competitive cost. And you can do that in an alternate proposal. All right, guys, what's going on in the chat? Hello, hello, everybody. We are rocking and rolling. We are a few bids deep so far. We got Osiris second time on the live. Let's go. Jerson Delgado out of Arlington, Virginia, as well as Pat. So good to catch you live. Nice to see you, Pat. Good to, uh, glad, rather, that you were able to catch the live. I know a lot of people... Um, aren't able to for time constraints. Do you charge by miles or by the hours for the pickups uh, for 31 Titan? Um, we would have to look more. I think that was for the, the courier services bid. Um, trying to think of what were some of the details that we read on that. The pricing for that, the quantity, we read it as like per service, right? They weren't having you put the pricing in per, per mile. It was like per run. That's the way that we read it. And we could always get clarification from contracting. But I would remain consistent with that. Like per per service. Alphabet Yellow Room events were always pre and post events for whoever doesn't know for any military branch. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, within within the DOD, as, as we said, absolutely. Um, Steven. If, for example, the only hotel that fits the contract needs in the required radius are Marriott's, Hilton's, or other global brands, how does contracting expect this to stay total small business? So you are a small business, right? You're a prime. 
and you're a small business and the contract's coming to you. So that part of it, that solves the initial part of it. Now, if you are working with a large hotel chain, right, then we're looking at limitations on subcontracting, legal min middleman, right? Majority of these contracts are going to be underneath the simplified acquisition threshold. So now we're looking at the confines of simplified acquisition procedures. Okay. And it's, it's stated within simplified acquisition, acquisition procedures. I can't talk today. Um, that if it's below that threshold limitations on subcontracting does not apply to total small business contracts it still applies to say like woman owned veteran owned hub zone 8a right you still have to meet minimum requirements on those actually for self performance but if it's total small business set aside that's how you're able to operate this and that would be called what's uh what's called a legal middleman uh move for that type of contract. And that's exactly what we talk about on this channel. So that's the answer to the question. And we talk a lot about that. So um, definitely check out more videos and stuff like that if you wanna learn more about that. We have Matthew Austin from Norfolk, Virginia, first live as well. Welcome, Matthew. Do you include Net3060 on all of your contracts? I made you include that soon with my first sub and I'm not sure. So yeah, Net3060 is primarily uh, attached to service contracts. You're going to be invoicing in arrears to the government, right? So you may have to upfront that first 30 to 60 day period, you know, whether it's you know, yellow ribbon and it's a hotel and you are putting a card on file and they charge you after that. Or if it's paying a subcontractor, um, teamy partner, and you have to float that until the government pays you. It's more like net 60 on the first round invoice. And then once you're, you're set up in the system, those invoices will hopefully and typically um, reimburse a lot faster within, you know, more of a net 30 type timeline. So again, I may need to include that soon with my first sub and I'm not sure how to go about it. Yeah. So it's just clear. You don't want to hide anything from the subs. You, most subs are familiar with payment terms, right? And net 30 is not a crazy long time period that most subs would not be comfortable with, you know? Sometimes they'll, you know, offer an early payment discount for 14 days or less, right? Things like that. But it's not like you're asking for a three to six month window, right? That gets into more like construction, larger projects. That's a different conversation. And it's also different how the government pays because that's more of milestone progress payments where the government has to come out, inspect, uh, quality inspect and approve, and then release payment per milestones. For service contracts specifically, like I said, we're more within this 30 to day, 30 to 60 day window. And if you're working with teaming partners and subs that are in service, um, that's going to be pretty much speaking their, their language. Do we have to come out of pocket for these type of contracts? Yeah, the government, as we were just saying, never um, upfronts the money. Grace Johnson out of Florida. Hello, hello. Ronaldo, a great catching you live, Derek. Would this Yellow Ribbon event be a middleman example and one in your upcoming class? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. This would be something that would fit in the upcoming uh, legal middleman method class. And um, yeah, absolutely. I think we've we've explained it a little bit to this extent as you're the small business. Um, we would have to look to see more about um, what we would anticipate the magnitude of this being, meaning looking more at the quantity of uh, meals, quantity of rooms, right? Running some quick ballparks. But typically, it's especially if this is like December 1st and 2nd, two-day event only, you're not going to be in any sort of um, breach of the the uh, simplified acquisition threshold of 250k where we would have to say worry about working with a similarly situated entity for example to keep this in compliance um whereas like working with like hilton or large hotels then that wouldn't work so then that becomes problematic um so that's why we really look for the, the magnitude of the contract because simplified acquisition procedures, um, it's just different rules. And it's written that way on purpose. Like I didn't write the rules. We didn't write the rules. They wrote the rules. We're just, you know, we're just playing within them. Okay. We're, we're playing within the confines of what they've written. If they wanted it to be different, they would write it differently. But the reason simplified acquisition procedures exist, again, is because it doesn't make sense for the government to expend $5,200,000 for contracting to solicit and procure and review bids for a contract that's only $50,000 itself. It just doesn't make sense. It's inefficient. So 
when you're within SAP, simplified procedures, understanding the regulations and the rules of what you can and cannot do uh, is extremely important. So that's why we emphasize that, that on the channel. Does SAP supersede set-asides? No, no, it doesn't. So for example, 8A woman-owned, hub-zoned, veteran-owned, uh, those, if it's set aside for that, you have to meet those self-performance limitations still. It's, it's some people get it confused because you'll hear small business contracts and you're like, oh, okay, it's just small because those are small business, but those are micro socioeconomic categories. If it's just total small business, that's different than our socioeconomic classes, those, those big four. And limitations on subcontracting or um, the SAP rather does not supersede over those socioeconomic categories. Dr. Virginia out of uh, listening from Atlanta, Georgia. That's awesome. And to see, hey, Derek, I have a question about Yellow Ribbon. Can a hotel backdoor you on a potential government contract? I believe a sub took it from me. Um, not sure I totally understand the question or what you mean by backdoor. Um, can, a, yeah, like, can a hotel cut you out? Potentially, the government could sole source to the hotel. Um, that's one way they could cut you out. If the hotel is just a small mom and pop, chain they could cut you out that way as well um but but you know the hotel is they're gonna have to have a cage code or the government's gonna have to do some sort of um justification and approval for example to go direct to the hotel and they will do that if they're finding that bids that are coming in are just insane markups on top of what because they know what the hotel rates are um, so if the only options that they are getting are are bs quite frankly then contracting will say, nope, screw that. We'll write a justification and approval and make this work um, with a hotel, especially if it's going to be within simplified acquisition procedures. So if that happened, then that's uh, that's entirely entirely possible. Um, and it may have been that the bidders were, you know, coming in too greedy, or it may have just been contracting had their own other reasons, you know, for doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, amazing question today, guys. Amazing questions. Let's keep the train rolling for food waste services at the Hawaii commissaries. Department of Defense, of course, December, uh, December 8th. How did this one pull? Is it updated? This one's actually old. Interesting. I'm seeing if there was like an updated date, but there wasn't. This one shouldn't have pulled. I don't know why it pulled. Well, we can still look at it for um, learning examples, I suppose. I'll, oh, no, I'm sorry. I just, my eyes are going cross-eyed. Uh, it's due December 8th. I'm sorry. December 8th. So this is fine. Total small business set aside 562-111 solid waste collection out of Honolulu, Hawaii. Organic waste Store salvage and dairy products at Hickam Air Force Base, Ken, uh, Kaneohe Bay, Pearl Harbor, and Schofield Barracks. So they're telling us that the POP on this will be a base plus four option years. So another base plus four. This is being issued as 100 small, 100 percent small business set aside. So just at a glance, we don't know exactly what's going to be entailed in the scope of food waste services. But we know, again, especially for legal middleman contracts, this is something that would fit into a book of business potentially quite nicely and give you a reason to go to Hawaii on top of it. So this is a full-blown solicitation, 109 pages. We're hit with SF 1449 form. We're hit with our pricing cleanse next. So we'll have a, uh, it looks like a base clean for waste removal. It says pickup and removal of organic waste store salvage and dairy products and they're giving us an attachment with the estimated volume requirements but then down here we have sub cleanse so 001 aa 104 quantity for organic waste removal 52 quantity for store salvage removal 104 for dairy products removal and so it'll be just those three for the sub cleanse. And then base clean two. It 
is going to be repeat for our I want to say repeat for our option years, but that's not. Let's take a second here. Yeah, because they're saying for the base period, January 1 through December 31st, and then we have our subclins AA, AB, and AC. Then we go to 002, organic waste or salvage dairy products, same thing. Then we get to our subclins 2AA. Same here, but it's the same POP. So I could be missing something here or that POP may need to be updated because we know that's base plus four. And I'm pretty confident in what I'm saying here. Oh, nope. So I must be, I must be incorrect because now we go to the one zero zero one, which is how they're supposed to do the option periods. And then we see, so then what is all of these repetition of subclins so this is all for the base here we've got one a a a b a c two a a a b a c three a a a b a c and four a a a b a c and that's all base here seems like there's layers to it. So maybe we'll discover more of those layers below, but that's something I definitely have a big question mark next to. So then it'll be repeat for option years, one, two, three, four. So lots of sub stuff going on here. You can see how many pages is dedicated just to these pricing cleanse. Um, looks like more than 30 pages, more than 40 pages. Yeah, more than 40 pages of sub cleanse. So a lot more in depth than what we typically see, literally almost half of the entire solicitation in and pricing clinch. So I think contracting definitely has something in mind as to why they're doing it. And that's what we would need to discover or uh, submit an RFI. Because just based on the definition they've given us, it's after those three different differentiations between the storage and the dairy and the other one, um, they just looks like they just repeat. So maybe it's different locations, things like that. So they're telling us for submission of offers, which is good. We find ourselves at instruction to offers. So for the price, as the 1449 form, as always, technical and passive performance proposal submission requirements, technical capability is uh, our first sub factor A. Ability to provide pickups of the specific groups identified in your proposal. And submit a written statement to explain how your firms will utilize pickup methods. Also submit a statement indicating the frequency and then also explain your contingency plan. So when it gets to a technical write-up, you're really responding to specific questions. You shouldn't be putting together some sort of technical approach or technical write-up, um, just guessing, right? Or just parroting back the statement of work. That's not what you want to do. You want to answer specific questions. You want to look for those. And that's what we find ourselves uh, facing here with this. Ability to provide paper containers and equipment. Like literally, these are all things that you need to be respond to as part of the technical capability. And it could seem like a lot, like, I mean, it's really not a lot if you look at larger contracts, but it's a good example of you, you use this to build the outline response for the different sections. And then also an outline response for past performance references. So three references, including scope of work, complexity, dollar value, contract type, and degree of subcontracting, right? So if it's if it was subcontracted, um, you would also spell that out. But if you're going to be working with subcontractors, they would probably self-perform it um, if you're going to be using subcontractors' past performance. So there is an attached uh, past performance survey as well, probably like a PPQ. Now they talk about alternate proposals here, which is interesting because we don't see this a whole lot, but we did mention it earlier on this episode. This agency is encouraging the submission of alternate proposals, specifically if combining of two or more groups will result in a reduction of cost. I can't make this stuff up. This is literally what I was just talking about generically. And now we found a specific example of this living in a solicitation. And sometimes contracting will say, we don't accept alternate proposals. In this instance, they're saying it is actually encouraged. So something is a feather in a cap, guys, for you watching the show today 
or watching on replay to learn, um, at least look out for if you ever find yourself facing a solicitation where you think you can do it better or your teaming partner is saying, hey, why do they want to do it this way? It would be so much easier or so much cheaper to do it this other way. This can win you bids. This can win you contracts. This can make you stand out because it is very possible that your competition will not be doing this. Site visit, notice of award, and then evaluation factors, of course, are going to mirror reflect what was asked for in the instruction to offers. And for past performance, they're going to be looking at timeliness, customer satisfaction, and business relations. And the odds are those are going to be reflected in a PPQ or the past performance survey that they mentioned. So we can also take a little glance at that. So please circle a number one to five that reflects the company's service. One being poor, five being excellent. So how would you rate the company's timeliness? So the, I haven't even seen this before, but it looks like my guess is coming into place. Are missing or damaged items delivered timely? Remember they said you're gonna be evaluated on your past performance for timeliness. Are items delivered in good quality? How often do you have to call the company because of something being missing, incorrect or damaged? Okay, how would you rate the invoicing and billing system for the company? So this would be the customer rating it on behalf of the company. So if you self-perform this, it would be your customer rating it for you. If you're working with a teaming partner, subcontractor, it would be their customer rating it for them. So timeliness, customer satisfaction, business relations, and those are the three exact things that we just saw in that past performance survey. So it all rolls up and makes sense very nicely. And based on all that, for your technical, you're going to get pass fail, acceptable or unacceptable. And then for pass performance, you're also going to get pass fail, acceptable or unacceptable. And then they're going to look at your price. Award will be made to the lowest price. And that makes sense. So only if you get acceptable ratings for technical and pa pass performance, then they're going to evaluate your price. And if you're the lowest price, then you're going to win. Alternate proposals will also be met, evaluated in the same manner as the primary proposal submission. So then we'll find ourselves into a lot of clauses. I think we're having a good idea of what that bid looks like. Hey, from Toronto, looking at a source of sought opportunity right now. I would say, why are you looking at source of sought? That would be my question. The paperwork is asking for similar contracts projects. It's a supply of product. Do I use my subs past projects? Yes, you can. You can do that, but just know through all this effort that you're putting in, you're not going to win anything. There's a 0% chance you're going to win anything unless you're doing some sort of uh, 8A sole source through responding to a source of saw. I would like to see you, as you could see, like they're asking for past performance. What else asks for past performance? Live bids that you can actually win. So if you're a team of one doing this by yourself, why not put that same effort into something right now that you can win? I'm assuming you haven't won dozens of contracts at this point, and, and it's likely that you haven't won any and you're just getting started. So if you're doing that, practice. I encourage you to practice the thing that you want to get good at. Don't practice the thing that you don't want to get good at because whatever you practice, you get better at. You don't need to get better at source of salt responses. You need to get better at solicitation responses. So to do that, practice responding to solicitations instead of source of salts would be my, my actual response um, to this particular question. Have you seen a lucrative LPTA or is it a race to the bottom? Would you focus on best value? No, I think LPTAs are okay. I think LPTAs, LPTA services can still be lucrative enough. LPTA products are closer to a race to the bottom because just in general, most products, especially especially like DLA dibs, Unison Marketplace, um, and even you know many commodity items that you see on SAM.gov, uh, those are more of a race to the bottom because you're just getting a number. And I don't say that things are bad. I don't like using labels like good and bad. It's just 
what is the, you know, kind of like what I was talking about with the previous question, what is the return going to be on your time? What are you practicing getting good at the right things or the, you know, the things that you eventually want to be successful at or things that you don't want to be successful at, but you're doing it as a stepping stone. Stepping stones don't really exist. It's you just start doing the thing. You jump in the deep end. Mo in most instances is the better way to go about it. So, for example, if you're trying to get into services, then I wouldn't start out with products because because, for example, the past performance you gained through products is not going to be relevant for services and you won't be able to use it. Um, but if you're wanting to build a products business, you you can. Um, but. It's not. It's, it's a lot of volume. It's a lot of being on the hamster wheel. It's like 50 to 100 bids a year. Um, and, and that leads to burnout. If you're putting those type of numbers up for service contracts, you're winning a good amount, right? So I'm not sure which is which, uh, cause you didn't specify, but yeah, for services, I do see more lucrative, uh, LPTA than products. Um, or I say products, I mean supplies. Yeah. And I'm not, and again, like I'm not picking on sources sought, like I have a video that literally explains the four stages of a bid and it's like a movie, like a movie's being made. It hasn't come out yet. Then there's like a trailer, right? The movie trailer, the movie trailer is the source of sought. You know, if you're watching um, Avengers, you know, at the end of Avengers, it's like, okay, end game or like the next one's coming out next Christmas. It'll be a whole year. Okay. Like that's, that's the cliffhanger or something like that. It gives you just a little bit. That's more like the source of sought. So it's not out yet. You can't go see the movie. It's just the trailer or it's just the clip. And then the pre-solicitation comes out and that's more like, okay, um, that's when they start doing like closed viewings, but it's not open to the public. And they're, they're saying like, uh, you know, in 30 days, it's going to be here. Right. So they're selling like the merch, they're doing interviews with the cast. That's more like a pre-solicitation Like you're getting closer. You're getting more information. You're getting more sneak peeks, stuff like that. And then when the movie actually comes out, that's like the live solicitation. You can actually go see the movie. That's the live bid. Um, and then the award is basically, you know, like the Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, like, well, how was it? You know, so I, I have a video that I did a number of years ago that explains those four stages as a bid in comparison to like a movie coming out and the process of a movie coming out. And the reason movies do that is so that they don't just say, hey, the movie's here, go and see it because no one's going to go see it and it's going to be a flop. So they hype it up for a period of time with these sneak peeks, with this additional information, right? So that when it's actually time, then there's adequate competition, you know, because contracting's goal is to maximize competition. Um, and, you know, the blockbuster's goal, you know, the movie theater's goal and the production companies, their whole goal is to, you know, have a, an amazing turnout with the movie instead of it being a flop. So think of it, think of the four stages of a bid, think of sources sought, as the trailer you can watch it you can invest time in it you can do it but it's not the movie itself and if you're just spending all day watching trailers well there's movies right now you can go out and see why don't you just go see those and start working on on those and then over time you can open things up if you want to build more of like a pipeline and a funnel you know and have things coming up like 90 days out and watching them that's great not what I recommend. It's not bad, but it's not what I recommend. If you are a team of one, two or three, you're brand new to this. You haven't won 10 plus contracts yet. You may not even know what you're doing. Have a clear offer. You're trying to learn legal middlemaning, all these sorts of things. Keep it simple, man. Like, and that's what we try to do on the show. Just learn how to bid. It's the best return on your investment. My understanding is responding to sources out often results when contract solicitations come out, you will be favored. No, you will not be favored. Um, you will not be favored at all. They cannot favor you. They can't say, hey, you know, it, it's, it's, at, it's at best, it's an indirect form of marketing. And again, it's not bad, but it's just what could be bad for you is opportunity cost. Like what, what better things could you be doing with your time? If you don't have a team of 10 to delegate to do all this more detail type stuff, more smaller ROI stuff. If it's just you or you plus one, you have to focus on the big ROI stuff because otherwise you're missing it. You don't want to miss big stuff to chase small stuff. You don't want to miss dollars and be chasing pennies. Okay. If, if you're 
capturing all the dollars and you're maximizing all that, then you can start doing quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies to, to get some of the smaller stuff, but focus on the big stuff. Otherwise you're just missing the big picture. Um, so they can't favorite. They're not going to be biased towards you because you responded to a source of salt. They cannot, um, like it's, it's technically not legal for them to do that. The only way that they can favor your company is based on what you responded to in your proposal. That's it. So that means if you respond to a source of salt and you respond to a solicitation and then a competitor comes in and they didn't respond to a source of salt and they just respond to the solicitation, do they still stand an equal or strong chance of beating you? Even though you respond to the source of salt? Yes. So then where's the advantage? There is no advantage. Okay. Responding to source of salt is really to help contracting. Okay. Because it helps them formulate what it's going to be set aside for. So if you want, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. I already have responding talking about source of salts. Um, but it, you, you provide feedback to help shape the requirement. That's the purpose. How many vendors that are WSB are going to be interested in this? Well, none. So I guess we're just going to open it up to a total small, right? So it influences set asides very much. Okay. Contracting uses that information very much for set asides. It also determines a small business set aside whatsoever. You know, if no small businesses are, are interested, then they may just open it up to full and open competition because contracting has no confidence that small businesses are going to respond to it. And they don't want to have a flop that for a movie. So, okay, we'll just do full and open, unrestricted. Okay. So responding to sources sought influences that as well. It can get your name in front of them. And that's what I said, indirect marketing, but it's only worth doing in my opinion, when you're capturing all the big dollar stuff first. So that's what I was saying. This is not a masterclass on sources sought, but I don't want anybody to be confused, at least on where I stand and, and what I recommend, uh, whatever you want to do is up to you. And if you're playing the 8A soul source game, um, forget everything I just said. It's a totally different method and it's something that I did and I do highly recommend um, because it can be a big capture thing because you can sole source contracts through the 8A program through a source of SOT before it gets posted as a live bid. That's the only way you can do it. Sometimes even before it gets posted to Sam if you have a relationship. But that's a conversation for another, another day, another story. Really good questions though. So we have our yellow ribbon event out of South Carolina here. And guys, I want to, I actually, before we get into this, I just want to share, if you don't know, we are open. Like we just opened yesterday for early bird registration. Um, I just did a live stream last night that answers a lot of questions. I'm not going to cover it now. Definitely check out that video if you want to, but um, we're running our LMM uh, winter semester 2024. It's open. You can go to legalmiddleman.com slash class to check that out. Um, I'll turn on our banner for just a second. Right now it's saving 500 bucks, or if you uh, purchased the legal middleman course in the past, you can roll that investment over um, into the class if you're wanting to. So there's a number of ways to save. Class is kicking off January 16th. Um, early bird registration ends December 8th. So the, the $500 savings you're gonna lose if you don't um, register before December 8th. Um, you can still register up until New Year's, December 31st. Um, but it'll, the price is going to go up. So if you are at all interested, um, you can learn more. You can uh, click here to enroll, um, read through all the, the goodies here for you. We're also pushing out swag bags. That's going to have backpacks, books, T-shirts, hats, a lot of smaller cool stuff as well for those only that are going uh, as part of the early bird special as well. So in case you didn't know, I'm trying to make a lot of noise about it. You definitely want to um, check this out and also check out, uh, I put the video down below here. I don't think it's showing up for some reason, but here it is. I just needed to update. So yeah, you can watch the video for the full hour long Q and A if you want to, if you have questions or just email support at govkidmethod.com and we can answer your questions there as well. Okay, so now back to, back to our bit. So this yellow ribbon is small business set aside, 721110 for hotels. 
This is due. Okay, so this one is due December 4th. I'm seeing best value. Award will be made to the offer that represents the best value to the government. However, the government reserves the right to award no contract at all. Yellow Ribbon Family Program for South Carolina Army National Guard needs hotel and meeting space accommodations for Yellow Ribbon event being held January 5th and 6th. A site visit to the hotel may be required prior to award. And the location must be a full service hotel located within Greenville zip code. Restaurant or catering services must also be available on the premises. And the meeting room and general session space must be located on site. When, when returning the solicitation, provide this company information, including the pricing. What do we have for attachments? We have wage termination, statement of work, SF1449 form, I believe, and then a Q&A. So let's look at the solicitation document. All right, so this 42 page uh, SF 1449 form getting started with. We're hit with pricing cleanse, hotel sleeping rooms, 130. So 130 rooms. So this is a bit, bit bigger, right? Destination fee, not sure what that is. It says vendor shall provide optional destination fee for 130 rooms. Adult breakfast, 260 breakfasts for Saturday, January 6th. And then meeting space, parking pass, 500 of those. And then adult lunches, 675 adult lunches, 25 tables. So you see, this is in, in stark contrast, literally opposition to the last yellow ribbon that we looked at a couple episodes uh, or a couple of bids ago on this episode. Because this is, they're breaking down each individual thing, right? And what did we see on the previous yellow ribbon? We just saw one price. It was just one price. When you do it this way, as I said, contracting is going to know exactly what they're getting because you're pricing it out separately. And then they can compare pricing to see if something's like off kilter or out of whack. When you when they just ask for one price, they can't do that. So what can I say, right? Every bid is different. Um, that was the lowest price bid. This is best value bid. So contracting is, they really care. And it could be because that other one was reasonably uh, smaller. This one seems to be larger, right? 130 rooms. And if you think of these events, you know, there's sometimes big wigs that attend these events, right? Higher, higher ranking officers. And if it just becomes, you know, kind of a cluster nightmare, that's going to look really bad. They're going to be like, who put this event on or who in contracting was charged of this event? Like their, their vendor sucks. You know, the waiting time is too long. The lines are too long or they're out of food or the food is cold, right? If there's not enough parking spaces or there's not enough rooms, all things that can detract from what the overall mission of the yellow ribbon event is it happens all the time. And what happens is if you get one of these and you do really good, you're solving a huge problem for contracting. They don't have to worry about you. And then what happens? Then, then you get more, you get more of these events because they're going to have more. They all have more. Those who have them have more, they have them year round. Um, and that's how you grow contracts too, which means I highly recommend that you show up in person anytime you have an event based contract that you're working on. Thank you. Makes sense. Most people teaching government contracting don't explain it in simple terms like you. I appreciate that. And I, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> it is my story. I'm a, I'm a very, uh, slow learner and a hard learner. And I try to turn that into something positive with something that I do know quite a bit about government contracting. Um, so I'm glad that it being broken down in these simple terms helps you wrap your head around it and, you know, gain some traction. Okay. Awesome guys. So I think we're going to go ahead and end the episode because we did our live last night. My voice is a little challenging. So definitely like today's video, subscribe to the channel. Also shout out to everybody whose first live this is, but also shout out to all of our returning and, uh, returning members of our community. You are all so much appreciated. I hope you got a lot of value from today and got some of your questions answered as well. And also check out again, legalmiddleman.com. The book is going to be launched very soon. You can get on the wait list for that. 
Um, our course is live for Legal Middleman. If you want to check that out, that's there as well, ready to go. Um, we have people enrolling in that every single day. Um, and then you can also roll over that investment. Or if you haven't purchased it, you can go straight into the class if you want to join us for our upcoming winter semester that's going to kick off January 16th. And again, take advantage of that early bird pricing and swag bag that will be able to be shipping out to you. Um, lots of amazing stuff that I'm super excited. And uh, I want to take as many of you with us as possible that are trying to specifically learn to legal middleman government contracts. Do it the right way, compliant, and be competitive so you can start bidding and winning on SAM.gov. So that'll be it from you guys. Um, great session. We'll see you all next week with our next episode. Episode 50, we're going to have to do something. I don't know what, but it is uh, 50 since we've been doing this. So we'll try and make it special as well. Um, take care, guys, and we'll see you all on the next one. Amazing question.